um, when asked a question about, because I've got a big challenges for our time, I'm, I'm kind of more of a small challenges person, but I scratch my head long and hard. And the one thing that came up uh, to me uh, as a key issue um, at the moment and for the years ahead is all about uh, food and food security. And kind of the problems that we have in, in interacting with uh, food in an appropriate, healthy way, a way that might make up both ourselves and our planet uh, last a little longer than it might otherwise do. And the sort of problems we see at the moment, I think, are everything from kind of the global obesity crisis, people eating uh, far too much. Uh, we see kind of the, the, the little, the, Pesky um, cow on the right there. We all eat far too much meat, and that produces far too much methane, it's kind of damaging the planet, very kind of uh, fuel inefficient in terms of uh, creation of food sources for ourselves. And also what I see is kind of global crises around some of our kind of stock foods uh, where uh, pestilence and disease is very rapidly kind of destroying some of our food bases. Take just for example, the citrus greening which is currently wiping out a large percentage of the uh, oranges in um, Florida and elsewhere. 10% reduction in production in the last year alone. No one's got a solution yet, but I think part of the solution must be around looking for different kinds of sources of food, of protein, of nutrition, than those that we've re relied on uh, heretofore. So what are the sorts of solutions you might find out there in the media we heard about in, in the last talk? We, we know now we should be a little bit skeptical about what we read. Um, some of the solutions that have been put forward are everything from 3D printing of food. There are mad chefs out there who are promising that by dropping 3D food printers over Africa, we can solve kind of you know, hunger crises there. There are many others, um, a lot of funding going into kind of lab-grown meat. Although at present, the kind of that steak on the top right might cost you about a quarter of a million dollars to create. Sure, prices will come down in the years ahead, but I haven't heard anyone say that the price of the lab-grown meat will ever get to an affordable uh, level. Then we have solutions around kind of uh, soylent green and its derivatives, kind of uh, the new algal cuisine. Uh, one company's already started in, um, in California, I think in the last year, of a soylent-like product, although the flatulence, uh, the results is still a little bit of a challenge. Um, and the final solution that is often talked about, um, but which kind of fills most of us in the West with disgust, is kind of entomophagy or the eating of insects. And it's the insects that, for me and for the people I work with, both in the kitchen, uh, in the science, in the philosophy labs, and elsewhere, that's the one that we're putting our money on and trying to understand what is it that makes the eating of insects um, so disgusting to so many of us. And how might we go about changing the behaviours and the thought patterns of you and I so that when we see, when we think about an insect, it sort of seems tasty to us and we can't wait up, we start salivating at the prospect. Um, and if you look in, in, in a lot of the big sort of uh, research projects, and you'll find that this, this shift towards insects is being asserted as a key part of the food security for the future. Here we have in 2010 a widely cited um, report from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, who was stressing the exceptional nutritional benefits of many forest insects, and the potential to produce insects for food with far fewer negative environmental impacts than the many mainstream foods consumed today. That was 2010. Moving the clock forward to 2014, and what we see others going even further, uh, suggesting that eating insects might be the last great hope to save the planet. This seems to be the food source above others that is potentially plentiful and available uh, if only we can get people to think positively about it. Um, so how should, how should, how should this sort of debate go? What you often see is we, we understand the need to eat insects. Um, we understand that they're sort of very protein rich. They're full of the right sorts of fats. They're available all over the place, and so could be a part of the cuisine, uh, uh, of the food of the future. But currently, if you look on the BBC website, if you look in the newspaper headlines, what you find is that we're being told that we ought to eat insects. We ought to eat them because they're good for the planet. Uh, we ought to eat them because of their kind of, um, uh, sort of protein ratio. We, we ought to eat them because, you know, for, for, for the next generation. Here's a few examples of that with the UN saying, BBC saying, the UN urges people to eat insects to fight world hunger. The Observer, in a headline of one of their newspaper articles from last year, of course, we don't want to eat insects, but, we, but can we afford not to? That is the question. But I think these strategies, based on what we should be doing, and maybe on what other people are somewhere else in the world, I mean, there are 2,000 kinds of insects, of the 1 million kinds of insects that we know about, that are currently eaten somewhere in the world. Uh, maybe the fact that people eat them elsewhere, in Thailand, and in India, and in South America, that shouldn't move us towards thinking about eating them ourselves. 
But they were sort of logical and rational arguments about what's good for the planet, what's good for our own health, or what other people choose to eat, I think in the long term will never succeed in changing our food perceptions and behaviours in the West. Why not? That's just based on previous evidence. If you look back through sort of world history, no one's changed people's food behaviours by telling them you should eat insects or you should eat some other source of food, but instead you need other kinds of arguments in order to move people's uh, thoughts. I mean, to move people away from this kind of reaction, I mean, kind of like the Bush Tucker trials of so many reality TV shows are all about forcing those B and C uh, level celebrities into eating uh, insects. I think the top left is actually an alligator eyeball, but it's kind of the same res disgust response uh, across a number of people. That's what we kind of think of when somebody says, would you eat an insect now if I had some in my pocket and I offered some to somebody in the audience? It would be that kind of face you'd be pulling or thinking about uh, pulling. Disgust. And that for us is the insectivores, uh, insectivores dilemma. The fact that we should be eating insects, but that telling people that they should will not be the solution to move our behaviours. Instead, we need other strategies. And we need to make, think about how to make insects not seem like they're disgusting, but seem like they're palatable, delicious, something you might want to crave, in fact, rather than something you just have to eat for the good uh, of everyone. And this project is, is one that's done together, both with sort of sensory scientists like myself working in the psychology department in Oxford, but also with philosophers thinking about our kind of categorization of food and our relationship uh, to what we eat. Uh, and then with those working in culinary research kitchens like Ben Reed, who was the head of the Nordic Food Lab, famous for giving insects on their three Michelin star restaurant Noma uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, and also Charles Michel, who's a young Franco-Colombian chef, who's very keen. I mean, he, Colombia's full of wonderfully tasty insects, and he would like to get his fellow country men and women to change the way that they eat. And it's this collaboration, this kind of intersection between the science and the culinary arts philosophy uh, and gastronomy that I think might offer one way to changing our behaviours and getting us all out of uh, the insectivores dilemma. And the first thing to note is the task is not impossible. While instruction and, and, and kind of authority telling you what you should do and what you should eat has not worked, will not work, we think, it's clear that our food babies do not stay the same throughout time. We do change the kind of things that we crave and that we like. And if you go back to kind of the mid-1800s, no one could sell lobsters and shrimps. These kind of insects of the deep bottom feeders were, seemed disgusting. You had to give them away. Contrast that with the situation today where, when lobsters are, 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 and shrimps might be among the most delightful of seafood on the menu. That's a change in behavior over a century or two. Uh, and in a way, these kind of... Uh, crustaceans quite close, uh, genetically speaking, to the insects that we don't want to eat, but the seafood that we're happy to eat. So we can change behavior. The question is, what are the ways in here? Um, I think the first approach is to say, there are a million kinds of insects out there. So there are some that maybe are really disgusting, disgusting to all of us, because of the kind of food that they feed on, because of the kind of places you find them, in the trash can, or in rotting corpses, or elsewhere. But there are other insects that are, that are, are less uh, unpleasing uh, to us. So the kind of where we start off in terms of insects, when you think about eating insects, and when the psychologists in the labs doing the research on insect behavior start, we all think about those really disgusting ones. He wants me to eat maggots. He wants me to eat cockroaches. Those really are disgusting, and maybe they'd be, they'd be a hard sell for myself to eat as well. But those are just two of the kind of the million different kinds of insects out there. And if you think about all the sorts of things that we have, even just in the UK, it's clear that there are other insects uh, about which we have less of a disgust reaction. Butterflies are so beautiful and gorgeous to the eye, I don't mind one sitting on my arm. Or that kind of ladybird there, again, beautiful uh, visually. Would I mind eating those? Perhaps less uh, uh, unpleasant than the ones on the left. Ironically, of course, some of the most beautiful visually of insects actually taste pretty bad. The butterflies, I wouldn't recommend them, they're horrible. Uh, on the palate, even though they're nice eye candy, whereas the ones on the left, in fact, are more often eaten and can be turned with a little bit of preparation and cooking into a tasty uh, treat. But this, 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 this first part of the, of the solution of, of pulling apart insects into different categories and admitting some are disgusting and some are less so is key because all of the research in the laboratories, all of our thinking about eating insects is really being driven in part by the results of research by Paul Rosen in, over in the States who did the classic apple juice and cockroach experiment. All about kind of the transference uh, of, of disgust and contamination. The way it goes, you come into the psychology lab, he gives you a, a, a glass of apple juice, a glass of grape juice, how much would you like those two? Five out of ten, four out of ten. 
Then he comes out with a, with a cockroach that has been clinically sterilized, so it cannot give you any disease or harm. It's perfectly safe. Uh, he then drops that uh, uh, cockroach into the apple juice for a few seconds, swirls it round, takes it out. You have to count how many legs it has, so you're paying attention to that insect. And he says, now, that was a clinically sterilized cockroach. Now, how much do you like the apple juice or uh, the grape juice? And he finds a kind of a contamination effect from the cockroach that you will not touch that apple juice, even though you know it is safe to eat. But note, Rosin, uh, which uh, three decades ago was taking this insect about which we all feel kind of real disgust, and hence maybe uh, we might get a different story if we thought about other insects that might come into contact with our food. So just, I don't have evidence on this, but just anecdotally, you're in the pub on a summer day, you're there with your pint of beer, and along comes that lovely little ladybird, and it lands on top of the foam, on top of the head of your beer. Would you throw your beer away? I wouldn't. I'd just pick the ladybird out and carry on drinking. That kind of insect does not contaminate my perception of the beer in quite the same way that the cockroach might contaminate my perception of the apple. Different insects, different results, uh, I think. Another part of the solution here, when we think about different kinds of insects, is to, to think about transition insects. Those kind of insects and insect-related products that might just move us on the path towards full-time uh, entomophagy. And the most obvious one here has to be kind of bee-related products. Most of us will uh, like and eat and consume uh, honey. Not only that, many of us will also uh, be delighted to take propolin or, or, or royal jelly, a whole range of insect-related products that we already consume without thinking twice about it. Maybe that's one of the roots in. Just build out more kind of bee-related products. Maybe baby bee ice cream. If you eat the honey, why wouldn't you eat the baby bee? Turn it into an ice cream can be very nice, and that might be one part of the solution. Now, the other one is this. Um, these are uh, Omegas colonas from the Amazon. The uh, giant um, flying ants from the Amazon. Come in season for a couple of months a year. Uh, you take the wings off, you can buy them in bags of snack food in Bogota and other South American cities. Now, my wife, she is a complete neophobe. She hates all new food. She won't touch anything unless she's had it before. And she likes in burger and chips, fish and chips. But somehow, she loves these. One insect amongst the million that she will love and she craves, apparently the, the backsides uh, are the tastiest bits there. So we have kind of contradictory behaviours. My wife, she'll eat this stuff, she craves this stuff, but she would never touch any other insect. Think about the difference between the different kinds of insects and you find different stories emerging. And maybe if we whip these up into an ice cream or something else or a sauce, uh, we could get my wife uh, one of the hardest challenges a little bit more towards uh, a wider diet. Uh, strategy two um, is to think about uh, doing things stealthily. So I guess many of us uh, like peanut butter. Just one example of an everyday food that we might smear on our toast for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We would not think that we were eating insects when we had a peanut butter sandwich, would we? It's not there really on the label. Apart from the fact that the uh, FDA uh, allows the manufacturers of peanut butter to have about 30 insect fragments, bits and pieces, in every 100 grams of peanut butter before they have to declare it on the label. And in fact, whenever you're sort of harvesting fruits and vegetables, those insects are going to be an inevitable part of the kind of cultivation process. I think the numbers when it comes to ground coffee are something like 5% insect matter is just fine, doesn't need to be on the label, uh, you don't know any different, and you'll still probably keep eating the peanut butter uh, and uh, the coffee, even though you know the insects are there. So this, I think, given that they already are there in some of the food that we eat, we're all eating insects if we eat peanut butter, maybe this leads into this, this, this health by stealth approach that has been used so successfully by uh, the big food companies. Um, take the example of breakfast cereals. Go back five, ten years ago. They were very, very salty, maybe full of sugar, full of salt, possibly full of fat as well. Governments say you must reduce the sugar, the unhealthy ingredients in the breakfast cereals. The food companies under duress do so, and when they do so, consumers say, hey, what have you done to my favourite breakfast cereal? It does not taste the same. It's not as nice. Give me back the original. So what do these companies do? They've realised that if they drop the unhealthy ingredients straight away in a sudden drop of 10% of sugar or, or, or salt or fat, you'll notice it, you'll complain. So what they do instead is they do health by stealth. Every month or every two months, depending on the consumption of this product, they lower the amount of salt by 0.5%. Then two months later, another 0.5%. And then by the end of the year, they've got a kind of a 3% reduction. And three years down the line, you're looking at a 10% reduction in the unhealthy ingredient without anyone realizing. Let's just try reversing that. 
maybe next year our peanut butter should be allowed to have 6% insect parts, and then 7, then 10. And before we know it, we'll all be eating insects, still enjoying our favourite foods, kind of this health by uh, stealth uh, approach. I, I don't want to pick particularly on peanut butter, um, but elsewhere in our diets, the insect matter does make it in. It could be in the cochineal, used to be in the red smarties, or in various other feeds, uh, foods here. It makes a lovely kind of red food dye. It can be done uh, artificially now, but we might have problems there about the artificial colourings as much as we do about the insect-based colourings. Or think about shellac as well. So there are a number of examples where insect matter is already in our foods. Can we just fill that up uh, slowly? Um, and maybe the third approach, we think, is... Uh, to the insectivore's dilemma is to focus on the deliciousness of insects. The flavours, the textures, the mouth-lingering sensations that insects can deliver, but which you can't get from anything else you'll find in the supermarket uh, nowadays. And to make them delicious, probably what we need to re recruit are the amazing culinary talents and creativity of the top chefs and the chocolatiers. Here one example from Paris, kind of a locust Chocolates, cover them in gold, a very expensive material. Um, it's there in your face, but you might be tempted to eat one of those because it seems like so delicious and uh, it is covered in gold after all. Or you might go to Noma, and I think Noma's been doing a great job here in changing the discussion around insects. There you're going for your three Michelin starred meal, and you might get a couple of live ants if you can catch them uh, to bite into. I think the, uh, the, the Danish ants taste better than the English ones, so there's some kind of differences there. But here we have the chimp stick that you might be served at Noma, or if you're at the Pestival Festival in London, when, when Noma chefs and the, and the um, Nordic Food Labs came over to London, you might have this, a chimp stick, a uh, licorice root with some seeds, some uh, dried fruit, and some uh, herbs, and of course a few little ants stuck on there. Uh, seems tempting, Many, those, 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 those uh, Pestival dinners were full up for two days, and the waiting list at Noma uh, is pretty long, or people who are going to go be exposed to insects in a kind of a modernist cuisine kind of sense, made delicious and made an unavoidable part of uh, the experience. Or well, finally, maybe what we just do is just go for all the weak points. Uh, these are my two nieces. Uh, sometimes they come to Oxford and um, might rummage around in the freezer for something to eat. Uh, last time they came, uh, they were there eating um, some ice cream from the freezer. Uh, gobble, 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 until I told them it was really bee, baby bee ice cream. Blah, suddenly. Uh, so maybe by going with sugar, fat, caffeine, all the bad boys of cuisine, that might be another way to kind of hook us uh, on insects. They were loving the stuff until they knew what was inside, and then their perception changed. Uh, that is the challenge for us, and maybe the warning to you that if I ever invite you to dinner, be very careful what you might be uh, eating. So ultimately then, I think um, uh, kind of food security is a big issue for the future. I think insects are a key part of the solution. I think the real challenge here is to, to move our way of thinking about insects in the West from something we ought to eat to something that's going to be uh, delicious to eat. Um, that's not to say there aren't still challenges. Uh, currently, most of the insects are sort of foraged. When you think about the mass farming of insects, you get into an, all those kind of food crises we've had over the last year or two. Um, we might think about currently most of those insects are kind of, you know, intensively reared and then freeze-dried. It's quite energy uh, demanding. But what I see, for some reason, um, many of the world's biggest food companies, at least those I've, I've spoken to, have no insect, no interest in insects. They should be. Those are people I'd be wanting to, to change our behaviours, and yet currently they don't. So I think it's going to be a matter of a lot of the, the small companies, the startups that we see around the UK and elsewhere, coming to the market with little insect snack products, uh, some of those will fly uh, off the shelves, and those one day will be bought up by uh, the big boys. And ultimately, for me as a psychologist, this is a great, important, and challenging area as I try and take everything I know about the psychology of food, normally the food that you'd like to eat, and say, how can I use those insights about the brain science and gastronomy and neurogastronomy in order to change the way we think about insects uh, and change the future for all of us? Thank you for your attention.